right, good morning, my friend. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to Nettleton, Colorado. God bless you, sir. Welcome to uh, behind this building here because it is really windy and uh, snow has been blowing and uh, it's uh, sun is out, but it's kind of cool. Uh, it's not too bad. Am I coming in okay? I don't know. <laughs> Like I said, I'm standing right beside this tourist center here because if I stand beside the wall, it blocks the wind because the wind's coming from this direction here. But I'm going to be out there. If you saw the pan, you'll saw the cones out there. That's where I'm going to be in just a few moments after I finish this here. And uh, uh, it's about a 15 to 20 mile an hour wind, 25 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour gusts of wind. And uh, it'll be like that all day long. And so on days like that, I can't lift the banner but I lift my Bible, I lift my hand like I normally do, and I lift my Bible, and uh, I pace back and forth, and I do what I do out here. <clears throat> and uh, I'm a little different than most street preachers. Uh, I preach this sermon here, but I don't really truly uh, preach a sermon when uh, the camera's off and I'm out there with my banner. Uh, what I have been told to do by the Spirit of God, that I am to stand in the gap before the Lord and intercede for the people, the city, or, or the area, or the region that I'm in. And I stand in the gap before the Lord, interceding in the Holy Ghost. That's So I take, uh, the Lord's given me uh, Ezekiel 22.30 and Romans chapter 8. And uh, Ezekiel 22:30 is he sought for a man that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before him for the land that he wouldn't destroy it. So that's what he commissioned me to do that very first day uh, that I got to my corner back in 2019, Memorial Day weekend 2019. And uh, that's what he told me to do and that's what I've been doing ever since. And he joined that with Romans 8 that we don't know what to pray for. We don't know uh, what what's going on actually. I don't know the verses exactly, but it's Romans 8. And that is we pray in the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost knows what's going on. So that's what I do. I stand in the gap before the Lord and I intercede in the Holy Ghost. And I do that out loud. Everybody can hear me interceding for them. I've had numerous, numerous, numerous people over the months and the years come up to me and say, thank you, brother, for praying. And then I get a chance to talk to them. So everybody knows I'm doing something out here. I'm kind of standing right by this bench here. But that's what I do. I uh, Don't copy me. I, I copy Jesus Christ. When Jesus told me to, to do that, I said, yes, sir. So uh, I was ready to do what everybody else was doing. I had my big megaphone because I'd never been a street preacher. I've just been like, you know, any other minister walks, you know, not really, but uh, I walk around with my gospel tracts and I just talk to people about Jesus everywhere I go. <clears throat> and I always, I'm a soul winner. Been a soul winner since I got saved. And... Uh, back in 1973, 74, when I was about 19 and a half or 20, somewhere in there, I don't exactly know exactly, but I still had about a year, year and a half of the Navy left. And uh, so when I came to the street uh, to preach and to minister on the street, I was copy. I was looking at everybody else and I was gonna copy all the street preachers I was looking at on the YouTube network. <clears throat> and I didn't know. You know, I didn't know. I had no idea what the Lord wanted me to do other than that's what he wanted me to do. I got my banner. I got my all my outfit here. I got everything ready to go. Had my big megaphone. And uh, I was going to go out and preach the gospel, preach the word of God, preach to sinners that they're going to hell if they don't repent and turn to Christ. I was going to go on the street corner and do that. And the, that day that I, was, I left the house, the Lord said, don't bring the megaphone. Don't bring the loudspeaker. Don't bring that. Oh, that's... Like I did, wow, really, don't bring that. Okay, I'll sh then he said, I'll show you what I want you to do when you get to the corner. All right. Got to understand about a month and a half prior to that, approximately, I lifted my banner for the very first time at about nine o'clock Saturday night, just when I first got it in from you know the mail, uh, and it got shipped to me, and I went down the street and stood on a very busy corner. I lifted that banner for an hour and a half, shaking like crazy. I was shaking like a, like a leaf in the wind, shaking. I was so utterly scared. I thought, Lord, don't let anybody see me. Don't let anybody see me. I was so scared. I was uh, <clears throat> probably, that was probably around uh, sometime the first part of April of 2019. And I had people saying, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, God bless you. And I was at night. I was standing around the corner by, in the, by a building in the shadow. I mean, it was nighttime, like 9 o'clock at night. <clears throat> and 
and I still had people converse with me and I didn't say a word to anybody. I was so utterly scared. I came home after about an hour and a half of lifting that banner <clears throat> just to see what I felt like. I didn't know, I'd never done that before. I've never, never seen a banner outside of the church before I started doing the research on to do the street ministry. I've, I, I know that seems kind of weird for a lot of people, but personally, I have never ever seen a banner outside of the church building. I've always seen them on the walls. And when the Lord told me to do that, I thought, wow, that is really weird. I, could, I thought maybe that was my flesh talking to me. I didn't know. Anyways, uh, I came home and I said, Lord, that's not, I'm not doing that. No way. I, I, that's too scary. That is too scary. I can't do that, Lord. Let me take this off. Uh, I can't do that. And, uh, and so the Lord uh, didn't say anything to me, but I was scared. I said, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I am not going to go and lift that banner. And after about, God bless you, man. And after uh, then, that, that Saturday night uh, on Memorial Day weekend, the Lord came upon me so strongly, so powerfully, that He said, this is it. To, you go out now. And I made a commitment to go out the following morning. And uh, that's what happened, and I've been coming out ever since. I've never stopped. And it's been the blessed, most blessed thing I've ever done in my life. I have talked to more people than I have in my entire life as a minister out in the public. I've always been in the public arena. And so sometimes God will ask you to do things that are very scary to the flesh. You know? But you can say no to God all you want. <clears throat> and uh, God will get His way and He'll take everything out of your life. He'll destroy everything. He'll allow the devil to take everything away from you listen to this if you don't if you're if you can say oh I'm willing Lord to do whatever it takes and he says okay this is what I want you to do he says, oh I can't do that I can't do that and you don't do it and you don't do it you don't do it you don't do it and you quit you just fight God on your calling you just keep fighting him and eventually he's got good he's gonna say that's it and uh, he allows Satan to come into your life and Satan what his job is to steal kill and destroy he starts ripping your whole life apart I know, I've been there. Rip your whole life apart. You think you don't know what's going on, why this is going on. You're a minister of God and Satan's just destroying everything in your life. It's because you're being disobedient to the calling of God on your life. I'm serious about people who have a call of God on their life who are not obeying that call. Because if you're saying no to God and you know you have a calling of God to minister, to preach, to do whatever God's told you to do, and you're not doing it, oh boy. And if tragedy hasn't hit, it's coming. So I would, if you're listening to this, and yes, you, I would stop right now. I would pause this message, and I would get on my face and repent to God for not obeying the calling of God on your life because it's that serious. And if you just flip it off, oh, John doesn't know what he's talking about. That's his life. That's his interpretation. That's not mine. I can do what I want. All right. Well, if that's you too, have fun. I'm just trying to let you know the truth of what's going on in people's lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you're revealing the truth to people even as I speak. I thank you, Lord, that you take the words of my mouth and deliver them, Holy Spirit, to the hearts and minds of those who are listening. I thank you, Lord, that you're setting people free from the chains of this world, from the chains of spiritual darkness. I thank you, Lord, that you're setting people free and they're receiving you, Jesus, as their Lord, as their Savior. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling them with power to be a witness, power to testify, and boldness to preach the gospel wherever God sends them. Help them, Lord, to be willing and help them, Lord, to be obedient to the calling of God on their life, all to the glory of you, Father, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power and everything. Lord, you are wonderful, Father. We love you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So praise God. A little exhortation there for those who are not preaching the gospel. So this is our February 12th Sunday prayer letter. And uh, the theme that our letter is in, that we're in for a while here, is signs, wonders, miracles, praise and worship. All right? Praise and worship. Uh, there's no end in there, sorry. Praise, worship. There's five separate words 
all have individual meanings, all have individual actions and activities, but together they also dovetail to each other and they all point to God and God gets all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, everything the Father gets. You don't take anything from God, nothing, nothing, nothing. You give it all to the Lord. It's really important to live that way. Live a surrendered life. Live a fasted life. Live a life worthy to be filled with the power of God. Amen? Power of God. So our, our letter this week is titled, Full of Faith and Power. Full of Faith and Power. That's in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. We talked about that on Sunday. And uh, full of faith and power. Full of faith. When you look at the context and what's going on there, and you look at all the other verses pointing back to that, verse 8 in chapter 6 of Acts talks about Stephen you'll find out that Stephen was full of the Holy, full of Jesus Christ. He was full of Jesus. Full of Jesus. He had no world in him. He was full of Jesus Christ. And he was full of the Holy Ghost. Powerful thoughts there to think on. To be full of Jesus. To be walking in Jesus. To Jesus be, I mean, it's just wonderful. When I got that revelation on Sunday, or Saturday night, whenever it was. That to really been on my mind a lot. Uh, Brother in Christ uh, shared with me Ephesians 3. Really important to, to look at the scriptures when people are talking like this, to search the scriptures on your own. You don't follow a man, you don't follow people. A lot of people get hooked up with this, uh, I'm gonna follow that pastor, or I'm gonna follow that evangelist, or I'm gonna follow that church. No, 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 you follow God. Now, God may tell you to go listen to that preacher, go listen to that pastor, that evangelist, that minister, or that go to that church, yeah. But you constantly keep your eyes and your ear to Jesus Christ. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. You know, Eve stopped listening to God and started listening to Satan. Satan couldn't get to Eve, uh, Adam, but he got to Eve. <clears throat> That's what happens when you stop listening and following to God you start listening and following the world, which is under Satan. And his job is to steal, kill, and to destroy your life. Do you want that? Do you want that for your children? Do you want that for your great-grandchildren or your great-great-great-grandchildren? You're the pilgrim. You're the one setting the precedent. I don't care if you've been raised in a Christian family and you have generations of Christians. It could all stop with you. So it's your job to continue the legacy of walking in the Lord. Yeah. All of us have responsibility to carry the torch, carry the light of God, to share the light with people in our family. It's really important. I was witnessing to several people on the bus before I got on the bus, lots of people, probably 50 people, all waiting to get on the Netherland bus. And uh, I got a chance to witness to a couple of people, actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people but I only got a chance to really talk to two and so one of them one of the these people uh, I thought was a Christian because they you know they acknowledge Jesus is Lord and I really like Jesus uh, he's kind of my my thing and you know they talk to me a lot and come to find out that person is a typical Christian in today being prepared for the one world Antichrist government and church yeah, because eventually after talking long enough, I found out that, well, it really doesn't matter. I mean, Jesus is one way and Allah is another and Buddha, you know, you, all of them point to the same place. So it really doesn't matter. It's whatever your flavor is, whatever you feel like you want to do. And boy, I just, that really took me back because that is exactly what Satan is doing in the religious world. He is changing religions everywhere so that every religion accepts the other religion. So he homo homogenizes all the different religions, including Christianity. That's why Bibles have been changed. That's why other religious books are being rewritten to include all the other different religions. If you don't think that's true, think again. So that's why people like me and a lot of people who, uh, who go out and preach the pure word of God the world hates us because we are not. If I didn't, God bless you. Because if I didn't shut up at that moment with her, she would have really come hard on me 
and I would have, she would have cut me off and I wouldn't be able to minister anymore to her. But I stayed quiet. Now you could say, well, John, you should have told her the truth. I was telling her the truth, but I saw an end to where I can't talk anymore. I was sensitive to the Spirit of God for her life. It's really important. You can't push your agenda onto people. I did that for decades. First 20 years of my Christian walk, I forced people to receive Christ. I forced people to receive Jesus. I forced them. I would argue with them. I would make them receive Jesus. I would make them repeat after me. I would do all that stuff. And I found out that that was stupid. But I didn't know that because I was watching others and that's what we all did. That's why I tell people, do not copy. I know what that leads to. You, you can get ideas, you can get counsel. I'm not talking about that. You can get, you know, situations, you get questions answered. You know, we all have questions. I ask a lot of questions and I get the answer. I have, I, I ask people for counsel. You know, I have, I have people around me to keep an eye on me. <clears throat> so I'm accountable. But I take all, <clears throat> sorry, this, <clears throat> I take all this never had mucus until I moved to Colorado <clears throat> but I take everything what people tell me and I take it to God and then God sorts it out and gives me what he wants me to do you know anyways I don't know why I said all that I talk because it's in my heart you know I mean it's not you know some preachers, some ministers have an agenda. This is what I'm going to preach on, and I don't care what the Holy Ghost tells me to do. I'm going to, I need to preach this. But I don't do that. I am sensitive. As I'm talking, I'm also listening. <laughs> not to me. I'm not listening to my words come out of my mouth. Not with these ears. I'm listening with the ears of my spirit. Because my spirit is filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm listening. And I'm trying to repeat everything the Spirit of God is saying. It's kind of weird to say it that way, but that's what I'm trying to do. And that's normally what I do. Because I'm held accountable, not just to people and to churches, but I'm held to God. God's not going to provide any more sermons, any more messages, any more word of knowledge, word of wisdom, or any kind of the gifts of the Holy Ghost if I misuse them, if I pervert them, if I twist them, if I use them for my own gain. He pulls all that away. That's why I'm very cautious very, very cautious on uh, using, uh, being, you know, working in the ministry. I'm very alert to everything. I've been doing this a long time. I know what it looks like to do something on your own without the Spirit of God sanctioning it. Okay? All right, so we have seven parts in our letter. This is Friday, which is part six for Friday. And I'm going to try to do tomorrow's part seven because I won't be preaching on tomorrow. Tomorrow, Saturday, is the Sabbath day of the day of the rest and the Lord. I rest in the Lord. Never used to do a Sabbath, but I do now because the Lord asked me to. And what am I going to do? The Lord says, I want you to take tomorrow off, which would have been, that was Friday night, Friday afternoon, Friday morning, whatever it was. He said, tomorrow I want you to take that off as a Sabbath rest in me. Spend the day with me. So, I said yes. First time in my life. That was back when I, back in 2017. When I first moved to Boulder, I was uh, May, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So that was men, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So three, four, five, six, May 6, 2017. That first Sabbath of May of 2017. That was the first time I ever celebrated the Sabbath. But I didn't do it. The Lord didn't show me. Well, I want you to do it like the law says. No, because we're not under the law. Why would Jesus tell you something that's not under that's in the law? He won't tell you to go back in the law. If somebody tells you to go back in the law, that's a devil speaking to you. Yeah. We're not under the law. We're in grace. We're, that law has finished. Jesus said it is finished. We now started grace, the era or the season of grace. So the Sabbath I have starts when I get up in the morning on Saturday and goes all the way till I go to bed Saturday night. Then I wake up Sunday morning, first day of the week, and I go to work. Gee, gee, God worked on the first day of the week. I work on the first day of the week. I don't take the first day of the week off. Why would I take the first day of the week off? If God works, I work. God rests, I rest. But anyways, that's me, okay? So like I said, don't copy me. <laughs> that's an idea, all right? And I, it's been the greatest day of my whole week. Greatest day. 
You think, are you sure? Yeah. I'll stand before Jesus and tell Jesus, that day that you asked me to take off has been the greatest day of my life. Every week. It's amazing. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow is Saturday. All right. So uh, this has got, we've got uh, Isaiah 818. Isaiah 818. Man, is it windy. We had a big, uh, big old cloud of snow just cover this whole area. Just as I was uh, setting my camera up. I mean, oh my goodness, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> so, but we're doing it anyways. That's why I'm behind this building. But I'm going to be out there, okay, since I'm done here. Can't wait to get out there. I've already had five people hearing local people say, hey, thank you very much. God bless you. Have a great day. Or give me a thumbs up. I go, wow. Local people who know me. One of them walked across and says, hey, God, God bless you, brother. Thank you for being here. <laughs> we chatted for a minute. Isn't that great? I hope wherever you go, people say, hey, thanks for coming again. Thanks for being here again. That's why I love being on a schedule. People, can, people know I'm going to be here. All right, uh, Isaiah chapter 8, uh, verse 18 is the verse. But we're actually going to read 13 through 18. But we're actually going to read 11 through 18. All right, let's, let, let's do that. Let's just go all the way from 11 to 18. Uh, For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand. Strong, let me talk as I go along. With a strong hand. That's why I was telling you what happened back there in May, uh, the day before uh, I went out to preach with my banner. He spoke with me with a very strong hand. A lot of people think, oh, that's not God. God doesn't do that. Well, maybe not to you, but to some of us, He speaks with a strong hand. That's only been twice in my life that I remember the Lord speaking to me with a strong hand. And that strong hand, actually in me, personally, I sensed the fear of God. I wasn't scared of Him. I wasn't shaking and scared. But you can feel the fear of God when He spoke to me in a strong hand. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk. Instructed me. I'll give you an example. That's what he did. He instructed me to go now to 28th and Pearl and to do it. He instructed me. Isn't that amazing? A lot of people think they just can't believe that God can lead people. They want to go to the world. They want to go to another church or read another minister's book that just got printed because, you know, whatever. I mean, it just floors me. They have time to read another book or a magazine or go to a movie, but they don't have time to read the Word of God or to pray. It's all right. You reap the benefit thereof. The benefit is very little. And instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. That's what I've been telling you. Don't copy. That's the same thing he's telling you. Don't copy those people. Don't follow those people. Follow me. I am giving you the example of what to do. It's really important to understand that. Because the reason... Now, why is that? The reason why is because... Every one of us are uniquely made. And because of our uniqueness, our peculiarities, uh, we can relate to people, and we all hear this phrase, you can relate to people that others may not be able to relate to. You know? And so, you know, that's why you've got to be like what you are, not be like somebody else. Don't, don't, just be like you, right? <laughs> be like you. Even if nobody likes you, still be like you. <clears throat> all right, in the way that people are saying, verse 12, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say, A confederacy, neither fear ye their Lord, their fear, nor be afraid. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. See, there's a lot of Christians who are saying, Oh, don't fear God. And they quote the Bible verse in the New, in the New Testament. Don't fear God. But what happens is, is people pull out the, a piece of a verse, a few words, and they make a big doctrine, a big teaching on that one little verse. And they don't look at the verses above it, the verses below it, the whole context, or the whole chapter, or the whole book. They don't look at that. They just look at these few words. Fear not. Yeah. Or whatever. So be alert to that too. Verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts with himself. And let him be your fear. Let him, let God be your fear. 
Don't let man be your fear. Let God be your fear. If you're going to fear something, when we all fear something, I fear the ban- I fear people looking at me and laughing at me. Uh, uh, when I lifted the banner, remember I told the story, I feared people at that time, at that moment. I feared people. Let me tell you another story. Uh, on that, those first three months of going out uh, on preaching the gospel with my banner, uh, I had so much fear for those first two or three months, uh, May, June, July, probably two months, I had immense fear. Oh, man. Immense fear. I've never done that before. I'm not, I, you know, people were yelling at me. People were spitting at me. People were yelling. I mean, people were mad at me. And I didn't know what I was doing. I thought, I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> you know? Uh, but the Lord just kept, just, you're doing okay, John. Just keep on going. I said, all right. But the biggest fear I had, let me tell you this. The biggest fear I had is I was certain that there a car would pull up with that black windows, because there was a lot of them, and the window would roll down, and a pistol would come out and shoot me dead. I was sure that that was going to happen. That's how much hatred I was receiving in Boulder. Boulder's very unique place. <laughs> Not anymore. Lots have changed in the last three and a half years I've been praying for Boulder. Boulder, the spiritual climate of Boulder is completely changing. I'm seeing tremendous fruit. But that, not then it wasn't. And I feared somebody rolling that window down, a pistol coming out the window and shooting me dead. So I would go home and I would pray for a bulletproof vest. That's what I prayed for. For two months, I prayed for a bulletproof vest. I did my research. I was looking around. I started looking. I found the bulletproof vest that I thought I should use, I could use and stand with all day long. And I was praying. I said, Lord, would you provide? Because it's, they're expensive. Many, many, many hundreds of dollars. And I didn't have any money at that. Well, I did have money, but I, I wait till the Lord to tell me what to spend. And, uh, and so I was coming down to the line of really bugging the Lord about buying this bulletproof vest. And I remember so clearly, I was standing at the kitchen sink, doing the dishes, praying, because I pray when I do my dishes. I'm not just thinking about nothing. I'm praying when I do my dishes. I'm praying when I make my bed. I'm praying when I'm cleaning the house. I'm praying when I'm doing my laundry. I'm praying when I'm doing things. I'm cleaning my windows. I'm praying, right? I'm always praying, always praying in the Spirit. Anyways, the Lord says, if you buy, if you get that, if you buy or get that bulletproof vest and you put it on, uh, you'll have to wear it for the rest of your life. No matter where you go, even when you preach in church, you're going to have to wear it. Because no longer is your trust in me, your trust will now then be in the bulletproof vest. And when he said that, I immediately repented. And I just said, Lord, my trust is in you. It's no longer in the bulletproof vest. My trust is in you. And immediately, the fear of being shot, the fear of man, the fear and the desire completely left and not one second if I had the fear of man since that moment but it was really real I physically felt anyways another story there all right and oh man I'm sorry it's really pretty rough out here <clears throat> all right let's go to the next one here and uh Verse 14. Now let's go to 13 again. And sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Amen. 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. The Lord is your sanctuary. That's why I tell people, go into the sanctuary of Jesus Christ. You go into the sanctuary, and the sanctuary is in you. You are also a sanctuary, a temple of the Holy Ghost. A lot of people don't get that. You are to be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. Let him be, uh, let him, uh, uh, for a stone, a stump. Okay, let me go back to 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. I tell you, how many people, I meet people, I don't know if it's every day, but I know it's every week for sure. I read religious Christians who their sanctuary is not Jesus, is not God. I guarantee it. I met them in Louisville on Thursday, yesterday. Religious people. And their sanctuary is their church. 
Yeah, that's their sanctuary. That's a foreign concept to have Jesus as their sanctuary. That's why Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer. A house is a sanctuary. A house is a temple. A house is a church. You're the church. Be a church. If you're the church, then be a church. You know, you're a church. Let that church be filled with prayer. Really important. <clears throat> Hallelujah, right? Praise God. All right, 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary uh, and for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of infants, offense to both the houses of Israel and for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So, Jesus Christ is your sanctuary. When you move into that sanctuary, you automatically become a stumbling block to many people. Just like that lady today when I was waiting for a bus. I became a stumbling block for her faith. That's why she stopped talking to me about Jesus. Because I became a stumbling block. Because I represented the sanctuary of Jesus Christ. And she made a choice. I don't want to go into that sanctuary. I want the whole world to be my sanctuary. I like Jesus, but I want the world to be my sanctuary. And that's what she chose. Oh, well, you know, how sad, right? Maybe that's the type of person one day when she goes to hell, when she dies, she's, she's going to say, Jesus, let me in. I said, he might say to her, you know me, but I don't know you. You know me, but I don't know you. How sad. How sad. But she met a true preacher of Jesus Christ. When she was talking to me, the bus driver, another bus driver, came alongside. He stopped. He opened his doors. And, and uh, with a loud voice, I was right in front of the bus there. We opened the doors, and she was standing right there. We were waiting for the bus. And he said, are you that Jesus freak? And she started laughing. And I said, yeah, man, I'm the Jesus freak with a big Jesus sign. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. God bless you, brother. <laughs> and she said, oh, you're the Jesus freak. Yeah, anyway, so I'm the Jesus freak. <laughs> yeah. That's the old term back in the 70s. You know, Jesus freak. I'm a Jesus freak. All right? Crazy for Jesus. All right? And he shall be for sanctuary, for a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel. Jesus is a stumbling block and an offense to the house of Israel and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to wherever you're living. It is... You are the sanctuary of Jesus Christ, and you're an offense to the city that you live in and to the house of gods, gods, worldly gods, that are in your city. You're an offense. You're a stumbling block, and that's why people hate on you because they don't like to stumble. They think they're perfect. They think they're fine. They think everything is just great until they have a tragedy. Then they come to you. Last three and a half, almost four years now, and people have, actually it's been the last 40, 50 years, when people have tragedy, they call me, they get a hold of me, and said, and John, are you still preaching Jesus? I said, you know, of course. And they talked to me about Jesus. He says, I knew you wouldn't leave. I knew you'd, I could call you, and you would talk to me about Jesus. I said, yeah, well, you're calling a preacher, and I talk about Jesus. I don't talk about the football game. I didn't even know the Super Bowl was playing last Sunday. How many of you Christians knew all about the Super Bowl and you were enjoying it? I had no clue that the Super Bowl was on until Sunday night or Monday morning or something like that when people start talking to me about the Super Bowl. I had no idea. You know they had riots at the Super Bowl? Yeah, yeah Monday. I found out Monday afternoon. Somebody came and said, oh, did you watch the Super Bowl? I'm all about Jesus. What was I doing? That, that was my, So what was I doing on Sunday when everybody was out watching the Super Bowl? What was Preacher John doing? He was out there on 28th and Pearl preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was really hard on Sunday. But then it turned out to be good. All right. For a genus near. 15. And many among them shall stumble. I, I get it today. I get it. I get it a lot. People don't want Jesus. They want the idea of Jesus. They want the idea of the love of God. But they don't really want the love of God. They really don't. They may sound say it, but they don't. So you just can't convince people. If they don't want Jesus, then just go on down the road, man. Put the pedal to the metal and talk to the next person. You know, let, let that person be in God. 
can't force people to receive Christ. I don't force anybody. I just say, God bless you, man. Have a great day. See you later. <clears throat> long as you're telling them, long as you're a witness, if you don't mention Jesus to them, you don't, they don't know what you're doing, and they go by you, and you haven't mentioned Christ to them. Wow, that's kind of scary there. But I'm talking about those who are talking to people about Jesus. Okay. God bless you, sir. All right, uh, verse 15. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Be taken. Taken, what does that mean? Taken by Satan, the thief. Are you talking to your family? I'm, I say that almost every day. Are you talking to people in your life? I hope so. I am. That's why people don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> Verse 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Take a hold of the testimony that you've been given. Revelation 12, 11, We overcome the thief that is making these people stumble. We've overcome that thief by the blood of the Lamb, which they didn't want. And by the words of our testimony of being saved by receiving the Lamb of God that washed us clean of our sin. It's important to tell your story. Very important to tell your story. Very important. Bind of the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Verse 17. And I will wait upon the Lord. I will wait upon the Lord. I will wait upon the Lord. That's a declaration of commitment. I will wait upon the Lord. That's what I do. I wait upon the Lord. You know why? To wait upon the Lord. A lot of people think waiting on upon the Lord is doing nothing for the Lord. Well, I'm waiting for you, Lord. I'm going to sit here in my chair. I'm going to sit here in this bench. And I'm going to wait to see if somebody comes by me. That's not waiting. It's one form. One form of waiting. One form of waiting. But when you really look at the context of waiting upon the Lord, it is serving God, serving the Lord. I will serve the Lord. It says here, uh, uh, verse 7, I will wait upon the Lord. It also means I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. A serve the Lord is to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a servant. Are you a servant or are you some big kingpin? And I will wait upon the Lord, and and uh, Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. What happens is when God's people turn their back to God, God hides his face. The face of God is really important. I'm not going to go into teaching that, but the face of God is important. And when you disobey, you rebel against God, He hides His face. You don't want that. You don't want that. Even today, you don't want that. All right? You don't want that at all. Hide His face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for Him. Are you looking for God? Are you looking for Jesus Christ? Or are you looking for some feel-good thing? Are you looking for some fancy church? Are you looking for some fancy song that you can dance to? Are you looking for some praise and worship music that makes you cry? Oh, Jesus most lovely because I'm crying. It's all flesh. Are you looking for a church or a body of Christ, a body of people who are very emotional uh, in a for sense of flesh? They're very flesh oriented. They cater to the flesh. They minister to the flesh. They're all about the flesh. The emotions of the flesh. They don't talk about the spirit. Are you there? I'm, I'm cautioning you to get out of that place. Verse 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs. Let me talk about that. For, when he talks about this, uh, be, behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me. So the, Jesus says, pray for the... Uh, uh, the there's a scripture that says to ask for the heathen for our inheritance. Something like that. I don't know what the King James says. I was an NIV preacher for 25 years, but I think it says ask for the Lord for the heathen for our inheritance. And uh, we can ask for people to be saved. Lord, save them, Lord. And we pray and we ask Jesus to save people. 
I do that every single day, seven days a week. It's part of my supplication. And so when people are saved, they become a, one of your children. And your children become not your flesh children, not with your husband, your wife, you have children. I'm talking about spiritual children. Paul called all his uh, saints that received Christ his children. That's what they are. So you take care of your children. You be the parent, the example for your children. That's why I do what I do. I'm an example to people. Always have been. That's why a lot of people don't follow me, don't want to be around me, because they don't want to do what I do. And this is not what I've done. I've been, like I said, I've been preaching for 49 years, and I've done all kinds of ministries. And generally speaking, after a little while, uh, people stop doing what I'm doing. Why? I don't know why. They get all wrapped up in the world, I guess. I don't know. I get wrapped up in Jesus. Now, I've, made, I've had problems. Don't, tell, don't think I've never had problems and I've messed up. No question about that. But guess what? I must have asked for forgiveness. I'm, God must have cleansed me of all the junk I've done because I'm still being used of God. Hallelujah, right? Praise Jesus. Thank you for using me here in Nederland, Colorado. All right? So this is a five-hour day up here. You may see me do a 45 or 50 minute hour long sermon here, but I'm going to be here for five hours. I got here at 1045 and I won't leave till 430 tonight. See, just because the camera's off doesn't mean I'm not working. So when you see the camera in, you know that John's going to preach for several more hours. 70 years old. How many 70 year olds do you know are out still preaching on the, on the street? I don't know of too many. How many do I know? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do 18 one more time. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders. This year, I'm believing to have 2,000 children. This year. 2,000 children from the work that we're doing this year. You got to be putting, you know, you got to put, you got to be toiling. You got to be out there working if you're going to believe for 2,000 souls, 2,000 children. But that's where my faith is. My faith is to believe for 2,000 people this year of 2023. I had that last year too. It used to be 1,000 a year. And the Lord says, I want you to double that. I said, all right, sir. I doubled it last year too. And the Lord said, do you want me to roll it back down? That? No, I want you to keep it the same. All right, all right, all right. So my goal this year is to win 2,000 souls to Jesus Christ. God bless you, man. 2,000 souls for Christ. Now, they may not come this year. They may come next year. They may come 10 years down the road. But the work that we're doing, the seeds that we're sowing, the fields that we're plowing, all the work combined from this work will produce what I'm believing, 2,000 souls. And people don't know, should I give to that? Should I give my 50 cents to that ministry? Because I don't know if they, you know, I don't want to give my money away. I don't want to invest in that ministry. Look, well, if you invest in this ministry, you know that God's going to bring 2,000 souls for this year alone. You can also know that through the course of my life, there are going to be a million people in heaven because I live. How do I know that? Because God spoke that in my life. That's been my whole life. That's all I've been doing. That's why I touch people for heaven. I just don't win the lost. I'm not just about, I'm trying to bring people to heaven. And I do it in all kinds of ways and forms and fashions. One of the greatest ways, I'm trying to get other people to go to work for the Lord. Go to work. Quit serving the world and begin serving God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things that you want God will add them to your life. I wanted a new bicycle. I don't ride, I don't drive a car anymore. And my bicycle was pretty old. It's probably 15 or 20 years, 15 years old. And it was a $99 sale bike I got at Target. And I rode that for 15 years. Or well, something like that. But it's for California. And so I wanted a new bicycle for Boulder that can ride the trails. Uh, because Boulder has a lot of potholes and a lot of cracks. It's a mountain town, and it rides like a mountain town. And uh, so I, I needed a new bicycle, and I prayed for probably three or four years for a bike. But I was seeking first the kingdom of God. And then here about three, four, five, six months ago, whatever it was, 
Well, says, I want you to get a new bike. I want you to give your bike away. He showed me who to give it to. I went over there and gave them to them. They were very thankful. Got a chance to witness to them. And then, and then, and then the Lord said, now I want you to get that bike. I said, Lord, I can't get that bike. That's too expensive. No, that's yours. I want you to have it. Lord, I can't do that. John, I want you to have that bike. I said, Lord, I, 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 I just, it's too expensive. You know, I'm a $99 guy, a bicycle guy, you know. Bicycles nowadays are a lot of money. I mean, a good one, you know, that can, you know, good one. That's not going to fall apart because, like I said, I don't have a car anymore. And uh, so finally I said, Lord, I've, I've got to come up with some terms. I, you know, I was walking with the Lord. I was reasoning with the Lord. And finally the Lord said to me, okay, here, I want you to give, the, when I give you that bike, I want you to have in your mind that you are simply a steward of that bike that one day uh, there's someone praying for that bicycle that I want you to give them that bike. Oh, now I can do that, Lord. I can do that, but I don't want it for myself. I'll steward the bike. I'll hold the bike for the person that's praying for that bike. So that I prayed for four years, and God gave me this bike. The bike is brand new. It just was probably a five-year-old bike, you know, and uh, I think it came out five years ago. It's a new design, and uh, so I started praying for it as soon as it came out because I saw that that bicycle would work for Boulder. Not an electric bike, just a normal, regular bike. Well, not really normal, but sort of like that. And so when I came to the reasoning with the Lord that I would be a steward only, just holding it till the day that I can give it away, I said, okay, Lord, I can do that. You see, you, we can talk to God and figure things out and reason things together. We're not a robot. That's why we're no longer called servants. The Bible says, Jesus says, you're no longer my servant, you're my friend. Wow. My friend. My friend. Thank you, Lord. You're my friend. <laughs> my friend. Oh, I can't see my book. Sorry, hang on. I got a, a tear break. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm his friend. I'm Jesus' friend. Wow. That really hit me. I'm Jesus' friend. Yeah. That's why he bought me the bicycle. And isn't that wonderful? So I'm ready to give it away. You know, at any moment, the Lord says, this is who I want you to give it to. Yes, sir, man, I'm, it's gone. I'm not gonna hang on to it, I'm not gonna covet it. I go, oh, this is mine now. I don't live that way. I don't know, maybe you live that way, but I don't live that way. Everything I own is God's. Everything, even this body is no longer mine. My body is no longer my body. It's God's body for His use, not for my use anymore. All right, so that's the end of Isaiah. I'm gonna do one more thing real quick here. And I want to do Saturday, Daniel 4.3. It's really important to read Daniel 4.3. Uh, I don't have it marked, so hang on, hang on. Daniel 4.3. Daniel 4.3. Hang on. Daniel 4, verse 3. Daniel 4, verse 3. I hope you're circling these in your Bible or writing them down. And you're not just listening to me. Because the moment this video is done, you'll forget everything that was said. Or subscribe to the Sunday prayer letter and get the verses there or whatever, you know. I mean, uh, I'm not even going to get to see all the Bible verses. I got all these verses here. I got all these verses here. I'm not even going to get to all these verses. Uh, it's just, there's just so many that are all about the title of our letter, Full of Faith and Power. That's all we're talking about. How do you become full of faith and full of power? How does that work? All right, Daniel 4, verse 3. We'll just read this and talk about it and we'll pray. Verse 3 of uh, says, How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, 
and his dominion is from generation to generation. So she's read all about that. It's pretty cool. That's Nebuchadnezzar saying that. Nebuchadnezzar repented and received God. God gave him an extra, what, four, 15 years of his life, an extra 15 years, I think. Was it Nebuchadnezzar? Pretty sure. So he honored Jesus Christ and his kingdom. How about that? Too bad our president wouldn't do that. But our president's all about the Antichrist. Oh well, getting the world ready, getting the United States ready for the Antichrist. People are buying into that. Not me. I know exactly what's going on. Anyway, so I'm going to read that uh, Daniel 4 one more time. I'll read it first one here. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Nebuchadnezzar was speaking to all the earth. How can one person, one king way back then, 2,000 years ago, or actually probably 3,000, wherever Daniel was written, I don't know the year that was in, but it was a long time before Jesus, <laughs> and Jesus has been 2,000 years. So it was a long time before that. Don't know when. It's not important to know when, because that's not going to get you saved, and it won't lead anybody else to Christ either. But it's fun to know. It's fun to know, but I don't need to know right now. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, all nations, all languages that dwell in all the earth. <laughs> he had no satellites then. Whoa, hang on. Anyways, he was talking to everybody. Kind of like what I'm doing now. And that dwell in the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. How about that? He's preaching to the whole world, and he said, peace be multiplied unto you. Isn't that what I do? Are you saying hatred be multiplied to you? I'm saying peace. That's why God bless you is on my banner. I talk about the love of God, the peace of God. It's really fascinating. I mean, it's really a... I love my ministry. Verse 2. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. I thought it good to testify of what God has done, all the signs that God has done, all the wonders and all the miracles, so that we can together praise Almighty God, Most High God, and worship Him. That's what we're doing in this theme. So are you closed mouth about all the miracles that God's done in your life? Or are you talking to people about the miracles? Every day I talk about the miracles that happen in my life, all the signs and all the wonders that follow this ministry. If you invest and you give into this ministry, you can partake of the harvest, the fruit off this ministry. It becomes you partner with this ministry. It's very important to pray to God to become a partner of the street ministry in this missionary church because as a partner, you get to reap the investment return, the profit of, the, of the, being a partner. Why, that's why the disciples prospered in their ministry. They gave up their businesses. They gave up their careers. They gave up their high-standing positions and followed Christ. And the Bible says, if you seek me first, you're going to get everything you need. But he says, if you seek first the world and you love the world, then the love of God is not in you. Woe is to you. Verse 2, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath brought towards me. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Praise God. That's Daniel chapter 4, the verse 4 verses of chapter 4. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that Nebuchadnezzar, the king who spoke to all the world, all the languages, and all the people, and all the nations, that peace be multiplied unto you. Hallelujah. And he wanted to declare all the signs, and all the wonders, and all the miracles, to have the people praise you, Lord. Man. Lord, that's what we do. We praise you. We, are, we worship you, Almighty God. We worship you, the Most High God, Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. We thank you, Jesus, for hanging on that cross and shedding your precious blood for the remission of our sin, and setting us free from the chains and the bonds of this world and from death, giving us a new life, a new life in you. We love you, Jesus. We dedicate everything we're doing to you. 
We thank you for those who are saving. We thank you for Lord those who are healing. I thank you for those who are being set free of devils. I thank you, Lord, for the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits. I thank you for all the gifts of the Holy Ghost that are coming to people as they minister. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for baptizing them with the Holy Ghost, filling them up with the power of God. In Jesus' name, filling them up with you, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them up. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Amen. Got a whole crew of people over watching, listening to me. <laughs> God bless you, man. I hope there was something here that you can use in your life and your ministry. I love you very much. Take care. <laughs>